So I'm excited uh, to uh, re-enter John 10. And also before we start talking about how Jesus is the good shepherd that lays down his life for the sheep, I want to talk to you about sheep. Because you can see why sheep need a shepherd. Uh, because I'm going to just share some facts about sheep. First of all, sheep aren't intelligent. <laughs> there you go. They are not intelligent. Okay, they are not known to be smart or cunning animals when it comes to safety. Okay, and, and they are susceptible and they tend to wander. They tend to wander away from the protection of the shepherd. And so, you know, just like we do, we tend to wander uh, because we, Jesus calls us sheep. The sheep actually tend to wander. That's why they need a shepherd. Secondly, they respond to the shepherd's voice. The sheep responds to the shepherd's voice, okay? Because the shepherd's voice brings them comfort. The shepherd's voice brings them security, okay? If you remember, which we're going to study today, Jesus said, my sheep hear what? My voice, and I know them, and they what? And they follow me, and they follow me. And so the sheep respond to their shepherd's voice. Thirdly, and this is so me, sheep are directionless. I know, I know right and left. I know if you tell me to go to quick trip and turn left, I know this. But if you want to ask me right now which way I'm facing, I have no idea. I, I know, thank you, Debbie. I know that I'm facing front, okay? <laughs> That's basically, and my husband is so good with directions. And I am telling you, how many are bad with direct, like north, south, east, west? I'm telling you, it is, it is not good. And my husband grew up in nowhere, Iowa, uh, you know, Okaboji, Iowa, and of course it was always, you go south at the tree, you go north at the, at the intersection, you go that, north. My, so I had a grandma, his mother-in-law, in the car, and we were driving out to Lost Island, Lost Island, and I'm driving, okay, and it's a, it's a, it's a uh, lake, and I'm driving, and she's saying, well, Margo, you need to go uh, north on this, and then south at that bend, and then, the, and I looked at her, I said, Grandma, you might as well be talking Greek to me. I said, because I have no idea what that is. Now, if you point me towards Lake Michigan, I know that's east, okay? I know that's east. And then I can figure out all the other ones, right? I can figure it out, but not like in the moment, right? So I am definitely a sheep uh, as far as directionless, okay? And, and I, not that I get lost easily. I mean, I just use other things, you know, to... You know what's so funny is somebody was telling me that, oh, we were going, how many went to the amazing uh, worship night at Elmbrook with uh, Matt Marr and uh, 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 Phil Wickham? And uh, it was out of this world. Well, on the way, we we're going to meet some friends, of whom we remain anonymous. She's here. And so, so she, I'm like, where are you? Oh, I, I'm, we're lost. I put the wrong thing in the GPS. I'm like, see, you depended on your GPS, right, instead kind of thing. So a lot of people just depend on their GPS now, right? And they don't really have a sense of direction. So um, the sheep get lost easily. They wander away from the flock, okay? And even if one sheep goes astray, the shepherd does what? Goes and gets him, right? The 99, but goes for the one and returns that sheep to the flock, okay? Because I want to tell you something. It's almost impossible for that sheep to find its way back. It's almost impossible. They have no sense of direction. Fourthly, the sheep are weak, and so they need a shepherd. They're weak and need a shepherd, okay? Sheep need someone to protect them. They need someone to look out for them. You never see a beware of sheep sign anywhere, do you? No, you won't see that, okay? In other words, no one posts that on their gate, beware of sheep, because sheep are not dangerous. They're virtually defenseless. And so they basically freeze in their tracks or at best run they can't scamper up a tree. They don't have a ferocious, you know, roar. They can't camouflage their color. They can't even swim. They can't even swim. And so when they're in danger, it's a poor, timid sheep. They panic. 
they panic. And so the sheep's best defense is to stay what? Close to the shepherd, right? Stay close to the shepherd, and then he will be or she will be absolutely okay. Now, sheep become restless. They become restless if they're hungry. That's my husband, okay? And they become restless with bugs. That's me, okay? But sheep become restless. There are two major reasons, and one is hunger, the other is bugs. Now, sheep can graze absolutely peacefully for hours and hours and hours, but they become restless if the food is scarce. A well-fed sheep will not eat out of a stranger's hand. Isn't that so good? Doesn't that like click with you? A well-fed sheep will not eat out of a stranger's hand, but hungry sheep will eat anything, anywhere. And so... The shepherd's job is to lead them, what, from, to green pastures, right? From pasture to pasture to pasture to keep them full. The other thing that gets them restless are bugs, okay? And so in the Middle East, there's a bug that torments sheep, and they nest on their heads. They nest on their heads. And if the bug remains undetected by the shepherd, okay, what will happen, it will, will, multipli- it will multiply and it will blind the sheep. So therefore, they anoint the sheep's head with oil, with oil, with olive oil. They, they put on the sheep's head, and that olive oil keeps the bugs from landing on the sheep because they don't like the olive oil. See, anoint your head with oil, right? Even the little sheep, right? And so that eliminates the problem. Okay, sixthly, a sheep is a personal, prized, precious possession. Personal, prized, precious possession to a shepherd. Because the sheep belongs to one shepherd. And that shepherd has paid a personal price to own that sheep. And it is not going to stand idly by while it was lost. Because he knows that sheep. And he knows that sheep by name. Sheep need plenty of water. They need plenty of water, okay? And in the Bible regions, the shepherds had to get their sheep to water very regularly because of um, the drought. And what happens is, is that if you don't, the dry spells, uh, and they're not able to get to water, the sheep will mob around a tree or a dry paddock, okay, or an empty water trough until they die of thirst, In other words, they don't go find water. That's why they have to be led, right, to the still waters, like Psalm 23. They they don't go, like, for instance, our collies. Willow, especially, uh, if her water dish is not filled, you will hear this. I'm like, Willow, okay, I'll be right there. She's like... You don't understand. I can't get my own water. You need to get the water, and it's empty. You need to get this now. She doesn't like to do it meanly, but she lets you know, and she won't stop until I get her water because she's drawn to water. She knows when to drink. She knows the sheep doesn't. However, here's another incredible statement about sheep because you you do realize we all like sheep have gone astray. Okay, sheep cannot get up on their own. I was just talking to Cindy Godard. She curls. She's a great curler. And you know what curling is, right? On ice with a, with a it's called a what? Help me. Stone. stone, right. With a stone, rock, rock, whatever. And you know, the American guys won in the Olympics and stuff. Really cool. She knows them. So I'm like, you know what? That'd be so cool to curl. But you know what? I could get, you know how down they get? They get down so far and they go on the ice, right? I don't know if I could get back up right away. She's like, oh, no, no, we help. We help. We help. Everybody helps everybody, right? I mean, but think about the sheep. The sheep can't get up on their own. It's called you're cast down. You're cast down. In other words, they have to have a shepherd come along and lift them up or they will die. They're not just like this, ladies. They're like this. The four legs are up. And they, it's called a cast sheep. It's a pathetic 
sight to see a sheep lying on its back like that with its feet in the air and it, 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 it absolutely flays away frantically, frantically trying to, to stand up and it cannot. Needs a shepherd. Needs the shepherd to watch after him. And then lastly, I just want to make sure about the voice again. The sheep follow the voice of their own shepherd. No other shepherd. They follow the voice of their own shepherd, okay? The shepherd's at the front of the sheep, and they lead their sheep. Here in the States, we usually drive them, like with ATVs or, or dogs. Not in the Middle East. I don't know if you remember all the videos we showed at the retreat, and we'd show how they would just follow. No matter if it was cliffs or whatever it is, they would follow that shepherd closely. And so um, he leads them, and the, and the sheep knows that shepherd, and he knows the sound of the voice, and he's going to follow him. And the shepherd can call the sheep, and they will come. Isn't that so great? Isn't that so great? They need no markings to distinguish them. There's no branding on them. Because they know their shepherd. And their shepherd knows them. All they need is the sound of the shepherd's voice. Same with us. Right? That's all we need. We got to know him to know his voice, right? So let's open up to John 10 and let's read about the good shepherd, starting with verse 1. <clears throat> I assure you, this is Jesus speaking, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the door but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. The doorkeeper opens it for him and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they recognize his voice. They will never follow a stranger. Instead, they will run away from him because they don't recognize the voice of strangers. Jesus gave them this illustration, but they did not understand what he was telling them. So Jesus said again, I assure you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired man, since he is not the shepherd, doesn't own the sheep. He leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. This happens because he's a hired man and doesn't care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. But I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I'm laying down my life so I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the right to lay it down, and I have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. Let's stop there for a moment. All right, so now, now we're seeing Jesus, right, having this contrast between the good shepherd and the false shepherds, right? Right? And who are those? Those are the Pharisees. Those are the religious leaders who've been trying to go after him time and time and time and time and time again. Because Jesus is the true legitimate shepherd who enters the way that's proper and that is prepared. Okay? And so we have been seeing in John's gospel here that Jesus had this great conflict once again with the religious leaders regarding the man that was born blind. Remember, we just learned that last week. And what did they do? They were, they were unhelpful. They were cruel. Not only to the man who miraculously saw, I don't know, his name is Jesus. All I know is once I was blind, now I see. Meanwhile, they were cruel to him. They were unhelpful. And also to his parents. And also to the neighbors that came around. And so Jesus felt it was necessary to talk about the contrast between his heart and work as a leader of God's people and the heart and work of the religious leaders of his day. 
And so he goes about telling them about sheep and the shepherd. And back then, political and spiritual leaders were often called shepherds in the ancient world. This was uh, out of Isaiah 56, 11. And so um, Jesus was explaining that not everyone among the sheep is a true shepherd. Some are like thieves, some are like robbers, okay? And one mark of a thief and a robber is how they gained entry among the sheep, okay? And so the idea is there's a door. There's a proper way to gain entry. Not everyone who stands among the sheep comes that way. Some climb up, some go around, some go through, right? And he's trying to tell them, look, the religious leaders, you guys, Pharisees, you gained your place among my people, meaning the sheep spoken here, through personal connections, through political connections, through education, through formal education, through manipulation, and through corruption. You didn't come through the door. He says, he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So a true shepherd comes in the legitimate and designed way. It's through love. It's through calling. It's through care. It's through sacrificial service. I mean, God always intended for his people to be led, for his people to be fed, for his people to be protected by those who come in the legitimate intended way. The door is there for a reason. And the false teachers are climbing over the barriers and, and are going around and everything, but God has those barriers there for a reason, and the door is there for a reason. I had been studying a commentary by Adam Clark, another British theologian who was born in the late 1700s, lived into the 1800s. He wrote a huge commentary, and this is what he says. Whoever, therefore, enters not by Jesus Christ into the pastoral office is no other than a thief and a robber in the sheepfold. And he enters not by Jesus Christ who enters with the prospect of any other interest besides that of Christ and his people. Ambition, love of ease, a desire to enjoy the conveniences of life, to be distinguished from the crowd, to promote the interests of one's family, and even the sole design of providing against want these are all ways by which thieves and robbers enter into the church. And whoever enters by any of these ways, or by craft or solicitation, deserves no better name than robbers and thieves. So in verses 3 through 6, Jesus is talking about the sheep and the, their shepherd. And he says, look at to him the doorkeeper opens. Okay, So in the spiritual picture here Jesus spoke of, the door for the sheep pen had a doorkeeper. Okay, And so that is one who watched, who came in, and who went out. And so the doorkeeper knows the true shepherd and appropriately grants him access. And in towns throughout the Middle East at that time, sheep from many flocks would gather and they would stay in a common sheepfold for the night. So it's, it could be Debbie's sheep, right? right? It could be Becky's sheep, right? It could be Brooke's sheep, it could be my sheep. So they're all staying together in this sheepfold. Okay, and so meanwhile, it's like, okay, they're all together and they're overseen by one doorkeeper who regulated which shepherds brought and took out which sheep. And this is what Jesus is talking about. And so he says he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them. So the shepherd out of this flock, or out of this fold, I should say, call out of this pen, calls them and calls the sheep by name and the sheep come to him. Like, my sheep aren't going to come to you. Your sheep aren't going to come to me. They all come to him, showing that the shepherd has a personal connection with the sheep. The shepherd leads them, provides direction and leadership without driving the sheep. He personally knows his sheep, and the sheep know him. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, is that how we're to live? Absolutely. 
You know, we have names now, what, for horses, dogs, cows, right? Well, the Eastern shepherds, they had names for their sheep, and they would call them by name. So I was looking up some uh, history on, on Middle East sheep tending, and some shepherds in the Scottish Highlands not only called their individual sheep by name, but claimed that an individual sheep would recognize its own name and respond to it. Also in this gospel, in John, Jesus calls the following sheep by name. Think about this. He calls Philip by name. He calls Mary of Magdala by name. He calls Thomas by name. He calls Simon Peter by name. And on each occasion, it is a turning point in the disciples' life when he calls them by name. It's the same with us. He knows our name. He calls us by name. He knows the hair in our head. It's numbered, right? And he cares for us. And then it says, and he leads them out. He leads them out. So it was a custom in the eastern countries for the shepherd to go to the head of his sheep then, and then they followed him from pasture to pasture to pasture. Why? It says because they know his voice. They know his voice. And so the shepherd just had to give a distinctive call, and the sheep came out from all the others. We saw that in a video uh, with Retreat, and it was amazing. All these sheep, and then he would use his distinctive call, and all of a sudden the sheep would look up and be like, there's my shepherd. There's my shepherd. See, you got to go, right? <laughs> Whoop, and there they go, right? And they followed him, and they followed him from pasture to pasture to pasture. Because why? Because the, the sheep are experts at discerning their shepherd's voice. Okay, did you hear me? The sheep are experts at discerning the shepherd's voice. Above all the other voices, it's the shepherd's voice that the sheep knows. There's a story of a Scotch traveler who changed clothes with a Jerusalem shepherd and tried to lead the sheep. Like he thought he could like fake them out. Like, like, look at I got the shepherd clothes on, right? And the sheep followed the shepherd's voice and not the clothes. Uh, another story was that during World War I, some soldiers tried to steal a flock of sheep from a hillside near Jerusalem. And the sleeping shepherd awoke to see that his flock had been driven off, and he couldn't recapture them by force, so he called out to his flock with his distinctive call to them. The sheep listened and returned to the rightful owner. The soldiers couldn't stop the sheep from returning to their shepherd's voice. The soldiers couldn't stop the sheep from returning to their shepherd's voice. It's the same with us. I love how Jesus used this illustration. It's a picture of both the work of Jesus among his sheep as well as those who seek to serve among the sheep that we need to focus on. And as I was going through these six verses, I, I noticed that there were like six marks of a, a true, legitimate minister of God a pastor, a shepherd, a leader, that, first of all, that person has proper entrance into the ministry, like he came through the door or she came through the door. And that pastor, shepherd, sees that the sheep respond to his voice or her voice and teaching and leadership. And that pastor, shepherd, is well acquainted with the flock. It's not like, they're over here and they're over here. No, this is an intimate, intimate relationship. And that pastor shepherd leads the flock and doesn't drive them or lord anything over them. He leads them. And how does he lead them or she? By example. By example. He goes or she goes before the sheep as an example and shows them what to do. And so in verses 7 through 10, we see this true shepherd protects and promotes life. And then what does the false shepherd do? 
takes life away, right? And so Jesus says, look at, I am the door of the sheep. So Jesus uses another picture uh, from sheep farming in his time. And out in the pasture lands for sheep, uh, pens were made with only one entrance. There was one entrance. And the door for those sheep pens was the shepherd himself. The shepherd would lie down across the door, and so it would stop the wolves from coming in, and it would stop the sheep from going out. Okay, and so the shepherd was, in fact, the door. Now, the thief, where it says, all whoever came before me are thieves and robbers, Jesus says, and they're not true shepherds, okay? The thief implies deception and implies mockery. The robber, that implies violence and destruction. And these robbers and thieves take away life, right? They take away life, but Jesus gives life, and he gives it abundantly. So the thieves and robbers are like con men and muggers of the spiritual world, right? But not Jesus. He's our absolute, true, true shepherd. And so those religious leaders who were actually tools in Satan's hand, as Jesus told some of the religious leaders that their father was who? Do you remember? It was the devil, right? It was Satan. So he goes on, he says, but, but, the sheep, but the sheep did not hear them. This is so great. So the robbers and thieves are trying to get attention to the sheep and everything. But the sheep did not hear them. So Jesus seems to say that his sheep are evident because they will not hear, they will not follow after the voice of thieves, the voice of robbers who come after the sheep. Because you know the shepherd's voice because you know his voice. How are we gonna know his voice? The word of God, the word of God. And the more we know the word of God, the more we know his voice and what he's saying. And so, and so he says he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So those that are the sheep that are following the shepherd, he will be saved and he will go in and out and find pasture. So Jesus described the settled, satisfied life enjoyed by his sheep, right? Because he's exercising shepherd care over them. So we're to have this incredible, settled, satisfied life because of our shepherd. And he says, you know, that they would go in and out. That's an old, a common Old Testament expression, and it just means the free activity of daily life. You would just go in, and out. You just go in and out. In fact, uh, my mom would always, uh, always tell me as I was leaving, Psalm 121.8, the Lord will protect your coming and going both now and forever. Psalm 121.8, the Lord will protect your coming and going both now and forever. So Jesus looks at him and he says, look, I've come so that you may have life. And that you may have it what? Abundantly, more abundantly or to the full, right? So Jesus said this in contrast. That here's his shepherd-like care, and here's the unfaithful, illegitimate leaders. I've come to give you life. I've come to give you life to the full, right? They've come to steal. They've come to kill. They've come to destroy. I've come to bring life to you. The Greek word for abundance is parisos, parisos, and it has a mathematical meaning, and it generally denotes a surplus, a surplus, okay? So the abundant life is above all the contented life, the contented life, okay? In which, listen carefully, in which our contentment is based upon the fact that God is equal to every emergency, that God is equal to every emergency and he is able to supply all our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean abundant life is an especially long life. It doesn't mean that. Abundant life isn't necessarily an easy, comfortable life. But an abundant life is a life of satisfaction in contentment in Jesus. Satisfaction and contentment in Jesus. See, 
If you put your satisfaction and contentment in your husband, you're going to be sunk. If you put it in your kids, you're going to be sunk. If you put it in your friends, you're going to be sunk, right? No, your satisfaction and your contentment is in Jesus. Why? Because all of your expectations then are in him, and he will never fail you. Everyone else will, and you'll fail someone else as well, but not Jesus. He's come to give us life, and life to the full. Spurgeon said this, life is a matter of degrees. Some have life, but it flickers like a dying candle and is indistinct as the fire in the smoking flax. Others are full of life and are bright and vehement. See, when we have his abundant life living in and through us, we have his stamina. You know that, right? We have his increased energy. We have his large sphere of living. We have his ability to do things in and through us. We have his joy that overflows. And we have what it takes to win because he's in us and he's already won. We're just playing an away game over here until we see him face to face. We're to live that life that is abundant. You guys, abundant life sheep give honor to the shepherd. Abundant life sheep. Don't you want to be an abundant life sheep? That's who we are, abundant life sheep. We give honor to the shepherd. We are a credit to him. You guys, we are the best sheep that he's got. This is it. We're his sheep. And we need to be abundant sheep that give honor to the shepherd. You guys, nobody's going to follow a cast sheep. Right? We said, like, what's wrong with you? What's right? Nobody's going to follow a cast sheep. They're going to follow an abundant sheep. And that's, what, that's why we're here, ladies, right? To become, what, conformed to likeness of his son. We can be this abundant sheep, and then people watch us, and they get homesick for what we have. And then we can tell them, oh, that's Jesus. It's the best thing ever. It's the best thing ever. My sister uh, calls me her bell sheep. I've told this story before, uh, and it bears repeating. There's a story that um, there was a sheep that was quite a naughty little sheep to the shepherd, and he would run away instead of staying in the flock. He would go over on the cliff, and he would go get stuck in the rocks, and the shepherd was always going after him. You know, the, a, he'd see a somebody, a predator coming after him, he'd have to go rescue the sheep, and he was constantly going after the sheep, okay? And so what the wonderful shepherd did is he picked him up, and he put him close to his heart, and he broke his legs. And he put him in a sling, and he kept him next to his heart. And he fed him the best grass, and he gave him the best water, and he heard the shepherd's voice right through his bosom, right? And, and that shepherd he grew and grew and grew, and his legs got strong. And so finally, the shepherd was able to put the sheep down. But before he did, he put a bell around his neck. And the reason he did is because that sheep was never going to leave the side of that shepherd ever again. Always knew that the abundant life was with the shepherd right there. And then what all the other sheep would hear the sound of the bell, and they knew exactly where the shepherd was. Don't you want to be an abundant sheep, bell sheep? You're leading him right to the shepherd. We're not doing the saving. We're not the shepherd. We're the ones leading them to the good good shepherd. Because in verses 11 through 15, he says, the good shepherd will lay down his life for the flock, for the flock. He says, I am the good shepherd. So Jesus said it so plainly, there could be no mistake on what he meant. I'm the good shepherd. And he fulfills the ideal of shepherd-like care for the people of God is illustrated in the Old Testament and in that culture. And they could understand that. They could understand that. 
And what Jesus described as a good shepherd was really quite a remarkable shepherd because shepherds would take risks and, and with their sheep and, and, you know, to save them for the safety of their sheep. But it would be very, very, very rare to find any shepherd that would actually be willing to die for their sheep. But Jesus gives life for the sheep. He says, I give life for, for the sheep. Here's what Spurgeon said. He is giving his life still. The life that is in the man Christ Jesus, he is always giving for us. It is for us he lives. And because he lives, we live also. He lives to plead for us. He lives to represent us in heaven. He lives to rule providence for us. He gives his life for the sheep. And he sees the wolf coming. It was assumed that there are wild animals, the wolf or bandits, the thieves and the robbers previously mentioned, that they would threaten the sheep. But the question was, how will the shepherd respond? How will the shepherd respond? Well, the good shepherd did what? Gives his life for the sheep. The bad shepherd, the hired man, was like, oh, I'm doing this for the money. I'm out of here. Right? The hired man doesn't do that because, you know, he's not going to defend the sheep because the flock basically exists for his benefit, for the hired man. But the good shepherd, what does he do? He lives and dies for the good of the sheep. The good shepherd sacrifices for the sheep. The good shepherd knows the sheep. The good shepherd is like, you know, we, I think we tend to think about how, like, all sheep are the same. But the shepherd knows your personality. Your, the shepherd knows your characteristics. He didn't make a mistake when he made you. Just like each of the sheep, he knew them by name. And each of them were different. Each of them were different. And the good shepherd is known by the sheep. There's like this mutual reciprocal knowledge between Jesus and his sheep, right? And so the more, or I should say, the existence then of this knowledge is the proof that he's the shepherd. It's the proof that he's the shepherd. And, and the faithful pastor, think about pastor or teacher or leader here, uh, as an under-shepherd, they're called under-shepherds, right, will display the same characteristics as the good shepherd, okay? He'll sacrifice, or she will sacrifice for the sheep. Know the sheep. Be known by the sheep, right? And so, and so he or she will be a shepherd and not a hired person who doesn't care about the sheep. That's not who a pastor is. That's not who a teacher is, right? In other words, a pastor, teacher, under shepherd can never display all the characteristics of who Jesus is, the same extent as Jesus, because that won't happen until we move to heaven, okay? But it should reflect Jesus' heart and Jesus' goal. So Jesus says to them, as the Father knows me, even I know the Father. He's always bringing God the Father into it, remember? Because it's like, remember, he's like, I'm, I'm, I'm God, Okay, I want to talk about God the Father now. So the work of Jesus as the good shepherd was rooted in his close relationship with his God and Father. That's how, where it was rooted. So then in verse 16, Jesus speaks of other sheep. He says, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there'll be one flock and one shepherd. So the other sheep are who? Gentile believers. They're Gentile believers, right? There's either Jewish or Gentiles, right? And these are Gentile believers, not of the fold of Israel, okay? Jesus said he must bring these sheep also who would also hear his voice. Okay, that would be us, unless you're Jewish, right? That would be us as Gentiles, okay? And so, and so um, Spurgeon said this, do not imagine that I shall lay down my life for the Jews, exclusively of all other people. No, I shall die also for the Gentiles. For by the grace, the merciful design, and loving purpose of God, I am to taste death 
for every man. And though they are not of this fold now, those among them that believe shall be united with the believing Jews and made one fold under one shepherd. That's Ephesians 2, 13 through 17. One fold under one shepherd. So there will be one flock. Okay, a fold of sheep is a part of the flock in its own structure or enclosure. Okay, so say there's a big flock of sheep, right? But there are different folds. You might have them over here because you don't want them to get pregnant or, you know, right? You've got all these different folds, okay? So a shepherd might separate the sheep into different groups to care for them better. Okay, so there's one flock, there's one shepherd, but Jesus calls his sheep from more than one fold. Are you following me? And so there are many folds, though one flock, though one flock. So here's what Spurgeon said. What, what was to hold this enlarged flock together and supply the necessary protection from the external enemies? Not enclosing walls by the person in the power of the shepherd, the unity and safety of the people of Christ depend on their proximity to the shepherd. Right? It depends on your proximity. The closer you draw to him, guess what? The closer you'll draw to each other. That's what happens. See, the unity comes from the fact, not from the sheep are forced into one fold, okay, but that they hear, that they answer, that they obey one shepherd, right? All different folds, but they're obeying one shepherd, and they'll, and they'll respond. And so it's the unity of loyalty to Jesus Christ as your shepherd that will all come together. So then in uh, verses 17 and 18, Jesus then tells them, you know, uh, I have power over life and death. <laughs> you guys, I just can't even imagine these Pharisees, these religious leaders. They must have been so stinking mad by now, right? Trying to get him, trying to do this, trying to, you know. You'll find it later on, you know, in this chapter 10 where they basically just, you know, come upon him. I mean, he's not even teaching and they like do a, want to lynch him kind of thing. I mean, they're always trying to go after him and, and he just continues to stand, remember, never flustered and just tells the truth in love. Walk, walks that truth and grace line, just keeps telling the truth in love and he says, look at, um, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to to take it up again. This command I've received from my Father. Remember we talked about that? That God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all raised Jesus Christ, right, from the dead, right? He's like, I laid my life down, and I'm picking my life up. You know why? I'm God. I'm God, okay? He says, look at God the Father saw the beauty of character and self-sacrifice in me, in his Son, in his Son. And he loves me more because of it. Isn't that so good? Can you imagine just that incredible agape, that amazing, perfect love? And he says, look, at, I, 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 I can lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. Okay? And in this sense, we can say that Jesus raised himself from the dead. He had the power to lay his life down and the power to take it up again. Anyone can lay down their life. Only Jesus could take up his life again. Only Jesus could do that because Jesus has the power to take up his own life and it's evidence of his unique relationship with the Father, with his Father. He says, this command, he tells them, this command I have received from the Father. So the death of Jesus was totally voluntary. You know that, right? Stepped out of eternity into time, totally voluntary. Remember, it was like, if you can do it any other way, <laughs> any other way, it'd be really cool. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So it was voluntary. It was part of the plan to, sub to submit to death and then to emerge victoriously alive according to the command received from God the Father. He always knew that. He always knew that. So then as he's talking... They're like, this guy's got a demon in him. This, this is crazy. Remember, that's what they always would go to. 
He's got to be possessed, right? So in 19 and 21, it says, Therefore, there was a division again among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, he has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Remember, they're going back to what he had just done, right? He had opened the eyes of the blind uh, man since birth, right? So now there's another division going on. There's a division again among the Jews, okay, because of these saints. Once again, listen carefully, Jesus is shown by dividing line of humanity. Jesus came to divide. He divides humanity between accepting me or rejecting me. There's no standing on the fence. No. You either reject him or you accept him. He comes to divide. So they, they're like, he's a demon. He has a demon, I should say. He has a demon and he's mad, okay? So Jesus made such radical claims about himself, right, that, that they were divided over him. Some believed who he was and they accepted, and others believed that anyone who claimed to be God as Jesus claimed that, you know, my word, he's got to have a demon in him. He's madder than a, a wet hen. <laughs> Ever seen a wet hen? They get mad. They get mad. Okay, so, so the words of Jesus were not the words of a madman. They were supreme sanity. Supreme sanity. The deeds of Jesus weren't like the deeds of, of, of someone being like a megalomaniac kind of thing. No, they were unselfish. They were unselfish. And the effect of Jesus wasn't the effect of a madman. Instead, he's changed millions for good. I'm one of them. How about you? Right? He's changed millions for good. And we know that. These are not the words who, of a person who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind, they said, right? So miraculous works as well, right? Open the eyes of the blind. What that did is the works validated his testimony. Remember, that's why he did the miracles. It was a sign pointing to, I'm God. I'm deity. I'm God in the flesh. So now Jesus arrives at the Feast of Dedication. Now, the Feast of Dedication, it's in verses 22 and 23. This is in the winter. It's another feast, and it's Hanukkah. It's Hanukkah, okay? And it's in Jerusalem. And Jesus just walks into the temple. He's not even teaching. He just walks into the temple, and he's, on, uh, he's in Solomon's porch. Now, this feast of dedication, I want to stop because it's very important that we know these different feasts and just don't you know, gloss over them. The feast of dedication, also known as Hanukkah, okay, celebrated the cleansing and the rededication of the temple after three years of desecration by uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. He was the king of Syria in 164 and 165 BC. BC. Okay, now, I want to share with you that after Antiochus attacked Jerusalem, he instituted a reign of terror upon the Jews of the city of Jerusalem. He stole millions in gold and silver from the temple treasury. He said that possessing a copy of the law was punishable by death, the law, Moses. He said that circumcising a child was punishable by death. He said that mothers who did circumcise their children were to be crucified with their children hanging around their necks. He said the temple was going to be and did turn into a house of prostitution. And the great altar of burnt offering was turned into an altar under the Greek god Zeus. And pigs were sacrificed upon the great altar. And under Antiochus Epiphanes, 80,000 Jews were killed and an equal number of slaves. Evil upon all evil. 
And so they're having the Feast of Dedication so they can remember how the temple is now cleansed and clean and dedicated to Yahweh God. You see how quickly evil can take over? I mean, when I read this, I mean, there were way more things that he did, and I didn't want to even put my voice to it. But that's how quickly evil can take over. But now, there's redemption, and Jesus is walking in the temple. And there's another confrontation, once again, between Jesus and the religious leaders in the temple courts, okay? But Jesus isn't teaching. Usually he's teaching when the confrontation began, and he's not teaching this time. He's on Solomon's porch. That is a, um, it's a, it's a Solomon's colony that was uh, the name given to the portico, which ran along the east side. Huh? East? I don't know. Hmm? East, 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 right? East side of the outer court of Herod's temple. That's where Peter addressed the crowd. Um, that's where Guy was healed at the beautiful gate from his lameness. That's where Jerusalem believers gathered regu regularly for their public witness um, to Jesus as the Christ, was Solomon's temple. So they're at the Feast of Dedication, and in verses 24 and 25 then, Jesus responds to the hostile question from the religious leaders. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, like literally surrounded him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. I remember when I was reading this and studying this, I remember so plainly, it was like for 31 years, Jesus would say, I told you, Margo, and you didn't believe. Margo, I told you, and you didn't believe. I told you, Margo, and you didn't believe. So so personal where, it, you know, they wanted to be right. I wanted to be right. It was a pride thing. This is what they've always done. They want, you know, in, instead of being right with Jesus, they just want to be right. And he's like, I told you. I told you this. And he's like, well, how long are you going to keep us in doubt? You know, if you're the Christ, tell us plainly. And so once again, they refused to listen. They refused to believe in Jesus. They hoped to blame Jesus for their unbelief. Isn't that so good? Isn't that so good? That's what I did. They hope to blame Jesus for their unbelief. How long do you keep us in doubt? Really? Really? You know, I was thinking about, this is like telling a traffic cop that they should put a speed limit sign up every 100 yards, and then you'd keep the speed limit. I mean, how, how many times do you need to hear it or see it, right? So this is, when I, when I was going back, I thought, okay, let me look at the things that he's already told them. Remember, these are the religious leaders and the Pharisees that keep following him and trying to get him and, and, and um, trying to disprove that he, you know, that, that this guy's not the Messiah. He's not the Messiah, okay? And so Jesus rightly said, I told you and you didn't believe. Back in John 3 when we were studying that, he told them, I'm the one who came from heaven. John 3, 13. I'm the one who came from heaven. He told them that whoever believes on me has eternal life. John 3, 15. He told them, I'm the unique son of God. You're looking at him in John 5, verse 19. He told them, I will judge all humanity in John 5, verse 23. He told them, all should honor me just as they honor God the Father in John 5. He says, I told you the Hebrew scriptures all speak of me. It's all a prophecy about me. He tells them in John 5, 39. I told you I perfectly reveal God the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father in John 7, 28. 
I told you I always please God and never sin. In John 8, 29. I told you I'm uniquely sent from God. John 8, 42. I told you before Abraham was, I am. That really got him upset, didn't they? Oh, they went nutsoid with that, right? The high-speed wobbles. They're like, what? You never even saw it. That's in uh, John 8, 58. He says, I told you, I'm the son of man prophesied by Daniel. In John 9, 37. And I told you, I would raise myself from the dead which we just heard in John 10, 17 and 18. Then he goes back and he says, and I told you, I'm the bread of life. In John 6, 48. I told you, I'm the light of the world. John 8, 12. I told you, I'm the door. He just did that in John 10, verse 9. And I told you, I am the good shepherd. In John 10, 11. See, the problem wasn't that Jesus was unclear about who he was and where he came from. That's not the problem. The problem was that the religious leaders had hearts of unbelief. They had hearts of unbelief, and they wanted to blame Jesus. He says, look, at the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. And so Jesus had told them by the very words, who he was, and now the works, as we talked about before, Jesus also demonstrated that I'm from God. Here's my words, and my works back it up. In other words, I walk my talk, right? This is who I am, and, I was, and I'm true to my word. When I was going through all, looking up all those I told you, you know, every one of us have to come to a point when we come to know him as Savior that you know that. That you know that. That this is who Jesus is. This is who the Good Shepherd is. This is the one who kept coming after you and kept coming after you as a hound of heaven and wouldn't give up and kept telling you, look, really, it's all true. I, I, I'm, I reveal God the Father, you know. I, I'm uniquely sent from him. I, I'm the bread of life. I'm the... I told you. And then he laid down his life for us so he could be our savior because he took the past, present, and future sin on him so that we could live life and life to the full, as he says, that abundant life. So why don't we live that? In closing, in verses 26 through 29, Jesus speaks plainly to the religious leaders about their condition. He says, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. You're not my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. How do you like that? You don't believe because you're not my sheep. The religious leaders wanted Jesus to speak plainly, and here he spoke more plainly than they probably wanted him to, right? You're not my sheep. He said, look, you guys aren't the true shepherds. You're false teachers. You're not even true sheep because you're not following me because the Messiah's sheep believe and hear my voice. They're not good. They're not true shepherds, and they're pitiful sheep. Right? And so he's sharing with them. Here's what Spurgeon said. Any person who reads without prejudice may easily see that our Lord does not at all insinuate that these persons could not believe because God had made it impossible to them, but simply because they did not hear and follow Christ, which the whole of our blessed Lord's discourse proves that they might have done. It's not that they couldn't believe. Same with all of us. It's not that we can't believe. It's we don't. We choose not to. All we like sheep have gone astray. 
Isaiah 53, 6. We've turned everyone to his own way, but the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He says, look, I give them eternal life. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. So Jesus explains the benefits and the blessings that come to his sheep. They have eternal life. You don't just have life now. You have eternal life given by Jesus. And that eternal life began the second you know him. Right? We're living eternal life right now. We just haven't moved yet. We haven't changed addresses yet. We haven't moved to heaven. But we're living eternal life right now, which is way greater than physical life. We're to live for the day, not today. It's way greater than physical life. Spurgeon said, physical life may be destroyed, but those who are united by faith to the Son of God, those who belong to the flock of the true shepherd, can never lose real life, for he keeps it secure. Is that so good? You guys aren't happy enough about that right? That he keeps it secure. And he says, look at nobody, nobody can snatch you out of my hand. Nobody can. It's expected that the good shepherd's going to take good care of his sheep. The sheep are safe. The sheep are secure in the hand of the good shepherd. Nobody can snatch you out. Isn't that so great? So if you're having a bad day and it's this, you're still in his hand. Nobody's going to snatch you out. Nobody can. And he says, not only that, nobody can snatch you out of my father's hand. Nana, nana, boo boo, right? Not only me, but my father's hand. So God's sheep, are, us, find safety in both the hand of the good shepherd and the hand of God the Father. Double, double safety, double secure. It's comforting to know that the hands that the, created the world hold on to me. Hold on to the believer, isn't it? Have sweet slumber tonight, thinking of that. Oh. Wow. The hands that created the world, hold on to me. Nope, nobody's ever going to snatch you away, Margo. Not from me. So undeserving, aren't we? And we get to have a good shepherd who gave his life for us and brought himself back from death so that we could live and we could live that abundant life. And he's seated at the right hand of God the Father right now, interceding for us, pleading for us, making a home for us. And some of us here, I'm sure some of our loved ones are already there. They're already enjoying that amazing home that he's made for us. Next week, we're going to finish up uh, in nine. We just have a little bit left. And then we're going to dig into chapter, I'm sorry, we're in 10. In 10, and we're going to dig into chapter 11, which is all about Lazarus. Right? Huh? Right? Come out, Lazarus. Lazarus, I, I've always heard that if you wouldn't have called him by name, everybody would have gotten up like who had been dead and walked out. <laughs> Come out, Lazarus, right? So we called him by name. But if you wouldn't have, like, oh, okay. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you that, that, um, that you are greater than all. That you are greater than all. And I am so thankful that... We get to be your sheep, and we get to be cared for, and we get to be protected, and we get to have safety. And, and uh, God, you, 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 know, you know who we are, and you lead us. You lead us to the green pastures and to the still waters, and you protect us, and you go after us. Lord, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you that you always had a plan and that plan included us. How sweet is that? Take us through the week, Lord. Knowing you more, loving you more, responding, realizing that, uh, that the hands that created the world hold on to each of us as a believer. Mm, Jesus, thank you.
We ask this all in your powerful name. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. amen.